Just want to say hi to folks as they're coming in the virtual room. We're going to get started in just a moment or two, but if you are already here and getting settled, if you have any questions or concerns, feel free to utilize the chat or the Q&A feature. All lines are muted just to prevent background noise, but we would still love to hear from you. Um, and like I mentioned, we'll get started in just a moment. Thanks. All right, well, we are going to have more folks join us in the next couple of minutes, but just for the sake of time, let's go ahead and get started. Hello and welcome to this webinar from the National Center for Equitable Care for Elders. My name is Arielle Mather and I am the program manager of this center. Um, we are so excited to have you with us for this webinar around promoting health literacy in older adults. Um, we have a wonderful guest speaker today, uh, Dr. Tamara Cadet. Um, you can see her credentials here. I'll read a bio in just a moment, but we're very excited to learn from her expertise today around health literacy. Um, if you are not familiar with our center, um, you can read a little bit on this slide. We would love for you to stay connected with us um, during and after this webinar session. We provide training and technical assistance um, to folks across the country, primarily community health centers who are serving community dwelling older adults. So you can check out those links there. We'd love again to, to stay connected with you. Certainly would love to hear if you have ideas or needs for training and technical assistance in the future. Um, and just because of the time that we are still in, I would like to point out in every webinar that we have um, around the Health Center Resource Clearinghouse. Um, if you haven't been to the Clearinghouse, it's a fantastic uh, one-stop shop for all things Health Center resources. And they have a priority topics page around COVID-19 that's always being updated with new resources. If you haven't checked out this page, highly encourage it. Um, we're going to be having more and more information around uh, vaccine rollout, especially for certain special and vulnerable populations. So feel free to check that out. And we all are very familiar with Zoom reminders at this point, but just so we can be on the same page, as I mentioned at the start, all lines are muted just to prevent background noise, um, but we would love to hear from you. We have a lot of great content today, but we would love to hear your questions. Feel free to utilize either the Q&A feature or the chat box to ask a question. We'll hold a few minutes at the end of this session um, for us to, to address those. And for anyone who's curious, the webinar is being recorded. We will send out um, an email after this session that has the PDF of the slides. And we also will update our YouTube channel pretty quickly this week to have the webinar recording that you can view um, at a later date. And when we wrap this session up, uh, once the Zoom window is closed, an evaluation link will automatically pop up. We'd love for you to take a moment or two to give us your feedback. That helps to inform future sessions. We'll also include that evaluation link um, in the email just in case you miss it when you close this out. All right, so since you signed up for this webinar, you saw the learning objectives. We'd like everyone, once they finish the session today, to understand um, age-related changes that could affect health literacy levels in older adults, uh, hopefully be able to develop some communication strategies um, for working with older adult patients, um, and then to learn about ways to support a shared decision-making approach that respects older adult patients' preferences and goals. Um, and I'm happy to introduce our speaker for today's webinar. Um, uh, Dr. Cadet is an associate professor at Simmons University School of Social Work. She also holds a faculty appointment at the Harvard School of Dental Medicine, where our center is housed. Uh, she received her PhD in social work from Simmons University and her MSW and MPH from Boston University. She has more than 25 years of practice experience. 
Her research focus is to develop and implement evidence-based clinical and health promotion interventions among underrepresented populations and communities. Specifically, she's focused on improving decision support in health promotion for an important vulnerable population, older adults with low levels of health literacy. She's been funded by the National Institute on Cancer, the National Institute on Aging, and the Health Resources and Services Administration. Dr. Cadet has authored more than 50 peer-reviewed manuscripts and presented her work nationally. And we're very honored to have her with us today. So take it away, Dr. Cadet. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, good afternoon to those of us who are on the East Coast and good afternoon, good morning to those of us who may be in other parts of the country. Um, I'm delighted to be here. And I'm delighted that you are um, joining us today to learn a bit more about health literacy. So I thought that I would just start with um, some definitions and really um, talking about sort of how um, our thinking about health literacy has changed over time um, from, so that we are thinking about, we are moving from understanding to application to actually utilizing um, health literacy principles in our um, interactions with um, patients and clients and with the health system. And so um, in general, why do we think about this? Um, what, we, what I want everybody to think about, um, particularly, and you'll hear me talk about it again, is the importance of plain language um, and what that really means and what that isn't. Um, and this idea of universal precautions approach, um, which has been um, interesting, I will share with you, um, new for me on some level as I sort of identify folks with um, low health literacy or limited health literacy. There's lots of language out there about sort of what's the best way to um, try and define folks um, who are not able to uh, understand or read or navigate the system in the way that we've set it up. Um, and I argue that we need to not set it up in the way that we think about it, but in the way that they think about it. Next slide. So what is it? You know, I wanted to start with Paulo Freire's uh, assumption that the word is not the privilege of some few persons, but the right of everyone, which harkens back to my original statement around, you know, this is about for everyone, you know, in the healthcare system, it gets really hard, it gets really complicated. And, you know, how do we make this, how do we make it easier for everyone and not just those of us who may be in the field and have learned these words? Um, I want us to be thinking about health literacy as a complex variable that's socially determined and a social determinant, so both. Um, and for those folks who may be silent or, um, you know, maybe you've had those patients and clients who nod and, and they're saying they get it, but they really don't get it, you know, if we can improve health literacy, if we can improve our organizations to support um, universal precautions approaches around literacy, we can change this culture of silence. Next slide. So back in 2000, the Department, US Department of Health and Human Services defined health literacy as the degree to which individuals have the capacity to obtain, process, and understand basic health information and services needed to make appropriate decisions. Next slide. And you'll see that there was an expanded definition um, uh, by the uh, Institute of Medicine in 2004, so four years later, which said health literacy is is, is all of what uh, the US Department of Health and Human Services um, use, but it's also an interaction between the demands of the health systems and individual skills. Next slide. And then the, what, we, what we discovered um, with the um, Joint Commission's report is that um, more just as important is it's a cornerstone of health safety. So we've gone from this idea of it just being this understanding, this, uh, this processing to an interaction to, in fact, it, it, it's going to benefit um, our patients around safety needs. Next slide. Then in 2010, so almost 10 years later from the original definition, um, the National Action Plan to Improve Health Literacy came out and they really wanted us to, they really recommended that we seek to engage organizations, professionals, policymakers, communities, individuals, families, everybody in a linked multi-sector effort to improve health literacy. So no longer was it just the patient, the patient's ability to understand and process, but it became everybody's um, 
responsibility and everybody's ability to sort of make this happen so that we would have more accurate and actionable health information so that it would truly be person-centered um, and that these patients and us, frankly, as professionals would develop lifelong learning and skills to promote good health. Next slide. So what is this universal precautions approach? Um, some of you may have heard of it. Um, we use it um, without sort of thinking about it, but really it's referring to taking specific actions that minimize risk for everyone. And this is where we get into these conversations around, you know, um, older adults with limited health literacy or older adults with low health literacy, or maybe it's just all older adults because at any given time in any given situation, an older adult may experience sort of a lower level of literacy than maybe they're used to. And that could be because they just found out some news that they don't quite know what to do with and they're in shock and they can only hear parts of it. It may be on another day where they're in, you know, a great mood and they're seeing you and they're understanding everything. But if we adopt this sort of universal precautions approach, then we just minimize that risk for everyone, no matter what they look like, no matter what they sound like, no matter what's going on in their world. Next slide. And so then we move to 2012 where they start to really, they really do start to focus on the organizations. So we move from this national action plan where it's like everybody is involved to prior to that where it was just the individual. And now, you know, in 2012, they're saying, let's look at the organizations that in which we work. That's really about sort of how do we help these patients navigate the systems and those health literate healthcare organizations make it easier for folks to navigate and understand and use information. So think about the very first definition where it's about individuals understanding and processing to health literate organizations making it easier. So those two begin to come together. Next slide. So today, today where we are, um, I use um, the slide from Dr. Rima Rudd, who's at the Harvard School of Public Health, um, and is just an, um, and is is the expert as far as I'm concerned around health literacy. You know what she talks about is there are the skills of the individual. There's talking and writing and posting, which happens from the individual as well as organizations. There is some emotional and physical. Um, physical issues around some, as well as some practice norms of the individuals. Um, there's, con and then there's the structural facilitators and barriers, the proximal task and the distal task and the skills of the professional. All of that is sort of on the outside of this idea of skills, tell skills, text, tax, excuse me, skills, text, task, and context. And health literacy is right there in the middle. And so you can see that no longer is it just the skills of the inter individuals, but it's the skills of the professionals. And it's all of those tasks and text and context that play a role in how we need to be thinking about health literacy. So it's a series of interacting variables. And you know, often we are focused on the skills of individuals. And I would argue that we also need to be focused on the skills of professionals and understanding what's going on with our patients when they're sitting in front of us. Next slide. So what are our goals? Some of you may have seen um, this particular image um, and it's changed a little bit, but you know, so often we talk about, you know, if we improve, in, if we improve health literacy, then, you know, in some ways we are minimizing inequalities. Um, and as you can see in the first, in the far, my far left, um, you know, you, we have um, three boxes where um, one person can see, one person can sort of see, and the third person can't see at all. And then we've been shifting in this in our conversations across the country, really around equity, where the everybody can see. But I'd like to argue that can we get to a point where we're justice, where we just build a structure where it doesn't actually matter what the height is. Um, and so when we think about universal a universal precautions approach, can we build a structure where there aren't these barriers, where we just create and talk in a way that older adults in particular can sort of understand the information, do what is important and what, what sits with their values and make good decisions based on those values that increase and promote their health. Next slide. So what can we do? So what we know is communication um, is probably one of the break, communication breakdowns is probably one of the most common reasons for um, events happening in the healthcare setting um, that are not safe. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about universal precautions and playing language and what it is and what it isn't. 
Next slide. So as I talked about earlier, it really is about treating all patients as if they are at risk at not understanding health information. I want you to sort of imagine for a moment, you know, if you've got to share with a patient, for instance, um, that they have a cancer diagnosis. And in that moment, this patient who may have understood everything else that you've talked to them about over the course of the months or the years, in that moment, if we just sort of think about emotionally how they may be responding or thinking about it, you know, it's that commercial, you see those commercials where you hear blah, 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 blah. They're not, they're not necessarily hearing. And so when we start to talk about, okay, so do you want chemotherapy? Okay, are you healthy enough to have chemotherapy? Okay, are you gonna have radiation? Okay, who's gonna be around to support you? Okay, these are all the risks. They may or may not be hearing that because they're hearing blah, 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 blah. Because in that moment and in that situation, their literacy level has dropped a little bit because of the emo emotional responses they may have. But when we use an approach of universal precautions um, across everybody, so situational and whether they are their quote unquote their high literacy or low literacy, um, we acknowledge that we can't accurately know who's understanding and who isn't. We acknowledge that it is situational, like I talked about. Um, recognizing that even those individuals with proficient health literacy skills may sometimes have problems understanding the information that we're giving them. Um, and then most important that everyone benefits from clear and actionable information, whether you are proficient or not proficient, everyone, this is, a, this is when we get to sort of the idea of justice versus equality. Next slide. So plain language, um, it really is communicating so our patients understand the first time they hear or read something that we're talking about. It's sort of using language that allows people to find what they need, understand what they find, and then act appropriately on that understanding. So, you know, I use lots of acronyms. So FUA, find, understand, and act. Am I using language when I am working with patients where that they can find the information, understand and act? And if they don't, do they feel comfortable enough in our relationship to say, Tam, I actually don't know what you're talking about. And that makes no sense at all. And making it easier for everyone to understand and use the information that I'm sharing with them. Next slide. So it's using everyday words that are simple and clear and concise. And sometimes we're sort of like, well, yeah, I am using everyday words. And, you know, I use an example. Um, my husband will often say, can you stop using the psycho babo stuff? This is not my world. I don't know what you're talking about. And my husband is very educated. Um, he's like, that medical jargon just doesn't work. Just say what you mean. And so I often test with him. I certainly test with my mother who is an older adult around that. And she's like, oh, you're getting too high and honey bring it down, bring it down. There, there's an easy way to say a screening test, just say test. And then you can explain to me later, but say test so I know where it is. Um, you know, as I talked about earlier, when we use plain language, it allows people to find, understand and act. And some people think it's about dumbing down or talking down to our patients, but it's not. And it's not this unprofessional writing or this method of doing either of those. What it is is saying, I am going to take the knowledge and the expertise that I have and communicate in a way that is going to benefit you because in fact, that's what we're supposed to be doing. That is our job to make sure that they're healthy. And so, you know, it seems strange that we would talk um, in sort of using our medical jar jargon words and think it's okay that our patients may or may not understand what we're saying to them. Um, we don't necessarily remove important information, especially if, especially if it's needed to make informed choices, but we just use simpler sentences. So I use test with my mother. Then I go on to say, my test looks for this. This is what you need to know. So I just slow myself down and I'm using much simpler words. Um, it's not that I'm being imprecise. I'm just being, cl I'm clarifying and being precise at the same time with shorter sentences. Next slide. So, um, you know, as I talked about, you're using simple, easy, understand words. Think about the language you use at home with fans or family. I would say with family um, and family that are not involved in, in your world, um, avoiding medical or insurance jargon and defining medical insurance and insurance terminology. So if there's a word that even for a hot second, you say it and you, you know, you would say, wait, do you know what that means? 
because let me, let, I'm just going to explain that to you just to be sure. Um, and then, you know, often we have like lots of things we're trying to communicate with our patients. Can it be, can we stick to one to three ideas? Because older adults in particular may or may not get after four or five ideas. Um, and maybe you're writing it down and maybe there's a caregiver that can help. But, you know, thinking about what are the one to three most important ideas Remove all words that you don't use. As I talked about using short sentences, use the active voice. So who is doing what? You know, Tammy, you need to do this because this. Tammy, your mother needs to do this because this, and this is why. Next slide. So we're going to be positive, of course. Um, I'm often reminded of the second point where, you know, instead of saying, don't, for don't forget to take your medicine, try remember to take your medicine. So can we be strength-based? Um, and it's hard when we're busy. It's hard when we've got lots of patients that we've got to see, but how can we be strength-based so that then it's not about feeling like, ah, oh, why are they telling me what to do versus, oh, they, they know that I'm going to remember it. And they're just reminding me that I'm going to remember. So I want us to be thinking about what can be done, but not what can't be done. Um, and then really, because there are so many, so many, so much information we're trying to communicate, can we put sort of those most important points first um, and then break them down into complex information, break that in complex information down into understandable pieces. So if there's five different pieces, how do we say, okay, one and two are most important. And can I break down three, four, and five into a way that's understandable and attainable in terms of um, knowledge for the patient that's sitting in front of me. Next slide. Oh, we're on our discussion. We are, fantastic. Yeah, so we still have more slides from Dr. Cadet around um, printed materials. So when we think about health literacy, there's a lot of different ways that that can come into play, whether that's the words that we're speaking, the words that we're writing or a patient is reading, and then certainly navigating health systems. But before we get into some of those slides around um, shared decision-making and, and written tools, we have a couple of questions that hopefully helps to break things up a little bit, but also can give a chance to folks uh, if they want to ask some questions in the chat box as well, we'll have some time at the end to do that um, additionally. But, you know, as much as this is a webinar, it's still an opportunity for folks to share about their experiences um, and certainly to ask questions when they come up. So a lot of what you've talked about so far, Dr. Cadet, has been, you know, especially with universal precautions, when we're thinking about how we can be mindful of the words that we're speaking and, and making sure that they're accessible to folks regardless of, of where they're at that day. But we are, you know, this webinar is wanting to have a little bit of a focus on older adults. And I wanted to, um, I wanted to ask you and get your thoughts on how low health literacy impacts older adults specifically. Are there special considerations we should keep in mind when we're interacting with older adults specifically? So I think one of the things that I think about all the time with older adults, the older adults that I see that I work with as a medical social worker, um, and certainly um, those that I interact with in my research, um, you know, you you see it, but you don't actually pay attention to it. And and I'm sure I'm going to say sort of these three things around cognitive and visual and hearing, and you're going to say, yep, 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 I know. But then we've got to be able to adjust our strategies to sort of deal with that. So when we think about low health li literacy in older adults. The reality is, um, I think the number is something like 40% of adults over the age of 65 have low literacy. So low literacy and older age go together. There's a correlation between that. And so when we think about older adults, um, in, as we think about adults as they get older, so they're in that older than 65 um, frame, you know, they're gonna have reduced processing speed. They're gonna have, they may have a greater tendency to be distracted, um, meaning, you know, you're having a conversation and they bring up something else. Um, and that's not a bad thing, it's just what's going on. Um, they may not be able to have as much of a capacity to process and remember new information. So their working memory decreases. And so when we talk about strategies, you know, I want us to be thinking about sort of those that plain language approach. Um, we'll talk about the teach back method um, and a little bit around sort of how do I know what's going on because this is what's happening cognitively. And then visually, we know that 
there are changes in, in adult vision over um, about two thirds of adults over the um, age of 65 have vision concerns. Um, and we also know that about a third of adults over 60 um, and half of those over 85 have really have common challenges with hearing. And I'm sure we've experienced that because we're talking with folks and, you know, I'll get, Tammy, I can't see that. Or um, talk louder, you're not talking loud enough. And of course I feel like I'm talking really loud. And so when we think about those changes that are going on, what we should be thinking about also is these changes are impacting, these changes are already um, part of the reason why they're experiencing low health literacy. Um, and so they're getting older, they're experiencing cognitive change, they're experiencing visual changes, they're experiencing um, hearing changes. And this is, this is creating the low health literacy in that for them. Does yeah. that make sense? Yep, yep. And I think that you'll end up answering this a little bit through the rest of the, of the webinar, but we do have a question um, in the chat box around maybe some basic universal precautions, asking what that would look like in, in a primary care setting as it's related to health literacy. So, I mean, I could think of, of several things and I think that again, we'll get some examples, but wanted to kind of see if there was anything else you wanted to add to that, especially thinking about older adults, kind of ways that we can, in a universal way, sort of simplify things for older adults in a primary care setting. So, you know, when I think about the primary care setting, um, I automatically think about the fact that, I mean, they're bu you're, you're busy. You're, there's no doubt about it that you're busy um, and you have a limited amount of time. But, you know, one of the, one, I think one of the sort of, e I'm going to use easiest in quotes, um, one of the easiest strategy is tell me what I just said. Tell me what I asked you to do. Tell me. So it's really, it's, it's really using this teach back method um, and really pick like the one most important thing that they need to walk out that you want them to walk out as your goal with and have them repeat it back to you. And, you know, on some, if there's a caregiver with them, have them write it down at the same time. So that if, if the most important thing is that, okay, you know, Mr. So-and-so, needs to take, yeah, I need you to take X, Y, and Z three times a day, um, Monday through Tuesday, or you know whatever the thing is. And this is the reason why. Then I want you to say, okay, Mr. So-and-so, tell me what I need you to do. And if that doesn't make sense, then we've got to break it down more. Okay, so on Monday, I want you to do it three times. On Tuesday, I want you to do it three times. And on Wednesday, I want you to do it three times. So there's lots of different ways to be able to communicate that one thing and really sort of thinking on your tools and then asking Mr. So-and-so, repeat that back. Oh, okay, on Monday, you want me to do this three times. On Tuesday, you want me to do this three times. And on Wednesday, and you, yes. And that's the one thing that he walks out with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's yeah, that that's great. I see I see a question yep, in the chat box that we might we might need to wait until the end to talk oh. about implications with COVID, but it's an important oh, it's an important. important question. I think Absolutely. we're gonna yeah, we um we are in the work, you know, we have in the works a webinar around um, instilling vaccine confidence in older adults. So that's going to be very related, but I think oh, it's an important absolutely. question. <laughs> so let's, um, <laughs> let's get to a few of these other ones and we will come back to the vaccine question. So how should we assess um, for health literacy levels? Now, there's, there's a lot that could be said here, but I'm curious, Dr. Cadet, what what your thoughts are on whether it's informal, informal or formal assessment. So I have been using, I have been doing a formal assessment in my research. Um, I use that brief four, four question, how confident are you are? How confident are you in reading hospital materials? Do you get help from somebody? Do you understand what the doctor says? Um, and I have found that of course, everybody is confident. And then I start to ask other questions and I realize that it's slightly different. And so, you know, I think that it's actually better. Yes, in research, we've got to use validated measures and maybe in your practice, you have to use validated measures, but there's got to be a way to sort of be informal about it. And so, you know, I've started to shift around doing the informal. So tell me when you, you know, all of this stuff is going on with you. Um, you know, are you understanding all? It seems overwhelming. And then I sort of get the, 
oh yeah, it's really hard to understand what they're saying. It's really hard to do that. Versus I say, so do you feel confident? Da, 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 da? Yes, I do. Do you feel this? Yes, I do. And so, you know, um, you know, there are lots of validated measures. There's, there's a health literacy tool shed that's out of, um, I think the BU, um, yeah, there we go. Thank you. I had it ready, I had it ready to go. <laughs> Be you, um, where you can see a host of different kinds of questions. And if you're not bound by sort of the validated one, I'm going to say, you know, be more informal and then lead yourself into some of those questions. And you don't necessarily have to do it exactly as it says, but to get at that idea, because who wants to admit that they're a low health literacy? Who wants to admit that they're, they're having cognitive changes that are affecting things? No one necessarily wants to do that. But if you have a relationship, of course, it may be easier. But I'm going to assume that in some cases, you may not have that kind of relationship. So, you know, there's a lot going on, Mrs. So-and-so. It must be really hard. I imagine this is what's going on. And that will then ease the make it normal and normalize it for them. And so that's how I think we should be thinking about assessing health literacy levels particularly with our older adults. Yeah, I think you bring up a lot of important points. And I did just just now put in, in the chat box the health literacy tool shed from BU. If you are interested in looking at um, a formal assessment that could be short, there are very short ones and there are very long ones yes. um, and a lot that focus on either a certain topic or explore kind of a list of words and you can see if folks are able to um, identify a related word, you know, there are ways to incorporate that kind of assessment into your practice of that, um, if you have the time and ability to do that. But to Dr. Cadet's point, you know, I think a mix of formal and informal can help you kind of understand a patient's strengths. And I, I appreciate the point about, um, you know, making sure that someone doesn't feel uh, embarrassed or ashamed of what they do or don't know, but to normalize of, oh, wow, there's a lot of information here. Do you have help from, do you get help from a family or a friend to read this, to fill out these forms, you know, even exploring, um, I saw this mentioned in another health literacy activity we did recently around just exploring what types of materials folks like to read, where they get their information from. Yes. TV, friends, family, if they're saying, oh, I, I like the newspaper or a news magazine, that might give you an indication that their literacy levels, not just health literacy, but literacy levels could be, you know, in a high school level, whereas if someone says, oh, you know, maybe TV or, oh, I just get my information from friends, that's not a guarantee there's low health literacy, but that might be an area to explore, but to you know, again, to ask those questions in a way that it's private, it's not making a patient feel like they're being studied, you know? So to the point of, if you, if Dr. Cadet is doing a study or there is a formal question, they, you know, people know that that's part of it. But if you're, if you're with a patient and you're wanting to kind of see where there's an area um, of potential low health literacy, we're wanting to get, ask it in that compassionate, respectful way. Mm -hmm. I think that's great. Absolutely. All right. Um, so you alluded to having some strategies when we're working with older adult patients, trying to encourage them to ask questions about their health. Curious to know your thoughts here. Um, absolutely. So I was trying to think of them in terms of um, those cognitive hearing and sort of visual challenges. Um, and I do think that, um, you know, in some of this, you're going to, you, I, I hope you're saying, okay, I do this, but now I want you to be intentional about doing this with every older adult that you're, that you're, um, that you're working with. Um, so we talked about sort of focusing on the most important piece of information that needs to get communicated, repeating it, and you may need to repeat it more than once, using those, that simple, concise language. Um, and then what I alluded to is, you know, what are the sort of the memory aids that can be used to help them remember? Are there brochures? Are there pamphlets? I am going to talk about that in a little bit and what that looks like. You know, you don't want the person to say, okay, yeah, they take it. And then, you know, it goes home and maybe in the trash. Um, but sort of really thinking about um, cognitively, what can they understand and how in the world can I communicate it in a way that they walk out with the one or two points. Um, and it is not, I don't know that it's not a realistic expectation to think that you can share 10 different things and our patients are gonna understand them, 
Um, and so you need backups, you have other support staff that may be able to help you as well that can sort of have ongoing conversations with them, but really think about the one or two things that are important that they can remember, have them say it back to you. We use a think aloud method that I'll talk about later when we're asking patients to review our pamphlet where they say everything out that comes to their mind out loud of, I don't agree with that, that doesn't make sense, why'd you use that word? I don't know what that word is. And that's very similar to the sort of teach back method. And then around sort of hearing challenges, you know, it's not necessarily yelling, which is what I think we're all inclined to do, but just increasing the volume and speaking slower and clearer. Um, and really don't minimize having a conversation looking directly in their eyes. I never take my eyes off my patients when I'm talking with them. I almost have to look at my notes really quickly, but I, you know, about whatever is going on. But, you know, talking to them, particularly around hearing changes, um, you know, some folks may mask the hearing changes because they're reading your lips um, in addition to sort of saying, in addition to sort of trying to hear you. So, you know, be really clear, clear about, you know, not having a lot of background noise, um, speaking clearly, not yelling, because you don't want them to feel like they're yelling, um, and really talking face to face. And then really around these sort of visual challenges, which are sort of related to the, mem the sort of memory reminders, are this idea of how do we make our information easy to see and read? Um, so do we, when we have these pamphlets, are they contrasted? Are we printed with the highest possible contrast? So black text on white background. We like, I like colors, I like green, I like yellow, but you know what? No one can see that, particularly if I'm having a visual issue. Um, using font sizes that are 16 to 18 size or large, and that then takes up a lot of space, which means you have more than one page, but you know your folks are reading it. Um, really making sure that you have spacing between the lines. You know, I like glossy paper, don't use glossy paper because that glare again, um, really does um, really does affect um, their, their, um, their ability to see. And so, you know, from, from the cognitive hearing and visual challenges, those are some of those strategies. But I would also say, um, which I think is where we're, we're going next is, you know, how is it that you can ask a question of a patient and for them to turn back around and say, huh, maybe I should ask something else. Maybe I should talk to you about something else. And that's really where this sort of idea of um, shared decision-making came into play for some of the work that I've been doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we'll transition to that in just a moment, but it just hit me as I'm looking at this question uh, that a resource that we've shared in previous activities that I will just link in the chat, we don't have it on a slide, um, but it's from the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. Some of you might've heard of the Ask Me Three yeah. um, approach where there are some materials that are available for download. I believe that you need to just create a free user account, but there's no cost for the materials. They're available in a few languages but there's brochures and posters. I'll, I'll link it in the chat now. Um, but really just encouraging patients to ask three questions every time they're at an appointment, which would be, what is my main problem? What do I need to do? And why is it important for me to do this? So some folks really like this approach because they're saying, okay, we can put this poster up. We're saying, hey, it's, it's okay and normal to ask questions that you don't need to feel like, um, that there's a, pro a problem with you if you have a question or, you know, it puts the responsibility on the provider or the staff to make sure they're communicating it clearly. They, you know, they're, they're giving room for the patients to um, feel comfortable to ask questions and doing it in that um, kind of specific way, the one, two, three, every time, hopefully will encourage folks to be more open to um, to being curious about these these conversations with their providers, um, but also hopefully have clear take home messages to know what they need to do next and be prepared, you know, for the next time that they that they talk with their providers. So just wanted to link that in the chat. And I also think, um, Ariel, this is a great point because I also think that you know. CDC has designed this for the patients, but we as providers can say, so what are your three questions for me today? Mm. Um, you know, I often do, you know, I walk into, into an older adult's home where I do some of my work 
And I'm, before I even like, I have my list of what I need to do with them. I know what the, what the nurse and the, you know, and the OT and PT have asked me to sort of talk about it and figure out with them. But I always, I'm like, so what do you have for me? You know who I am. What do you have for me today? And I assure you, I get questions that I am not prepared to answer. Um, and sometimes some of them have their, law, their 10 questions in a row. And I'm like, okay, well, I'm clearly not getting to what I need to get to this time. Um, and so it goes both ways. And that goes back to the way I defined the original definition is let's not just make it about the patient having to ask the three questions. Let's have the provider say, so what are your three questions for me today? Mm -hmm. Yeah, which goes a long way to opening up that conversation than just saying, oh, do you have questions where someone might say, uh, nope, 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 I'm nope. Good. Because that will be, yes, exactly. <laughs> so. All right, so to your point, Dr. Cadet, about uh, shared decision-making materials, we are gonna shift to some more slides where you talk about your experience with this. So I'm gonna mute myself and we can get started. Okay, so, um, I have always been interested in um, health literacy. I have always been interested in sort of materials because I do think materials complement um, the oral health literacy and oral health literacy is really important to, to many populations. And as we talked about, they don't always get it. So how do we make both the oral health literacy and the material health literacy sort of go together? Um, and so I'm gonna talk just a little bit about um, my experience over the last four or five years around developing materials um, and uh, give you sort of the one example. Um, and I just wanted to start with, so what did I learn? What I learned is, you know what? And I started to hint at it before, we need to include older adults or get their feedback as we are thinking about designing or modifying or implementing health education materials. Um, you will see the number of changes um, and a bit that I, that I made to something that I thought I modified that I thought was pretty good actually. Um, but what I learned in addition to sort of making sure that we include them is then we be, they become a partner. And then sort of that idea of Oh, let me tell you about what you've now asked me to give you some give you with their feedback, which is new for so many of them, particularly folks who um, are I, um, are considered low health literate. Um, but then they'll start to talk to you about some of their other health issues. Um, that was sort of the first first part of the lesson, and then the second part was really this idea: of how do we use non medical medical and non medical professionals? to help ensure that older adults have access to these materials. So, you know, so often we wanna put stuff on the web. Well, you know what, I can give you 10,000 antidotes. Timmy, I'm not getting on a computer. I am not looking on a computer. Can you just mail it to me? Can you put it in the church? Can you put it in some community-based agency? Can you print it and hand it to me somehow? Um, and of course, cannot do that during COVID. So we figured out some other ways. <laughs> Next slide. So when we think about in general developing materials, and these are certain things I started to think about when I was modifying this particular decision support tool, it's so what are those low health literacy principles that all patients, so universal precautions again, can benefit from? And so really the recommended strategy is involving, including older adults um, as you're developing it, as you're pilot testing them so that they can look at the language is it too complicated? Is it too medically? Is there too much jargon? Do we have it organized right? Do we have it structured right? Do we not have some of the initial feedback was, this looks so sanitary. Can you make it look like a little, um, give it something. It's so boring to read. Um, you know, these are honest feedback from members of this older adult community um, in this particular one. And then um, what we used was, how did we get that feedback? And I would argue that, in the same way that we get the feedback for developing the materials is the same way that you can think about having getting feedback when you have a patient in front of you around sort of asking questions of them around did they did you understand it how did you understand it but more importantly applying that teach back method so repeat back to me what you said and so how we did that was we had folks read um, part of each, each of the tools line by line with us, and it did take time, and it's a research study, so we have the time. And we would get questions of, well, why are you talking about this? Well, what does this have to do with me? Well, does this mean this? Does that mean this? And we started to get questions, and as there, where there was confusion, we we're like, okay, we've got to figure out how to change this after they've told, told us about it. Then we would have them repeat 
everything back. So in some cases, they would say, okay, so this page is about this. I would say, for instance, so if you were about to share this with a friend, what would this page, what would you tell them about this page? And like, I write 12 lines and they do it in two lines. Guess what? Change the 12 lines to two lines. <laughs> Next slide. So the example I've been talking about um, is a decision support tool called, should I continue having mammograms for women aged 75 to 84? And my role was really to take the existing one and make it usable for women over 75 who were at risk or with low health literacy. So older women with low health literacy. And I did all of what we talked about in the previous slide. Um, I did it initially, I did it with 17 women um, that we identified and we did identify them using that sort of validated tool, but that's when I started to learn about sort of, they're not always gonna admit some of this stuff. Um, and then we tested it um, in um, several community health centers um, in the Boston area um, to sort of see actually does it work in practice and what that might look like. Next slide. So what we know about why was this, for this particular issue, what we know is that um, clinical guidelines recommend that women older than 75 make an informed decision versus sort of younger women, they say you should get a mammogram at, at X, Y, and Z intervals. That's not necessarily the case. There's not enough evidence. Um, older women, older adults in general are not in clinical trials. So there's not enough evidence. And so what we really want older adults to think about is what is your health like? And if you were diagnosed with um, a breast cancer in this case, um, do you think the sort of subsequent tests and surgeries are going to be more helpful or more harmful? So understanding the harms and the benefits of either set of options, doing nothing or doing something. Um, and so what I really actually want us to focus on is when we use this think aloud method, when we, I looked at the, the, the initial decision aid tool, these are some of the problems that the women identified. The language was too advanced. There were just so many words they didn't know. We had pictographs, which is supposed to be the, the gold standard of how you communicate risk. And they were like, what? Why are there's all these little tiny pictures? What do you mean one out of a thousand? Um, we had women, um, particularly the African-American African -American women saying, how come all the pictures are of white women? Um, there were too many words on the page. They didn't understand tables. It was way too long. They didn't understand how we wrote continuing or discontinuing what uh, discontinuing mammograms. They had no idea what that meant. Um, and then interestingly around this conversation we've been having, they really, the way that we wrote this, they had difficulty understanding what it meant to discuss their thoughts with their doctors. And that is a huge one for me because no matter where they come out around their decision around mammograms, I want them to feel comfortable figuring out what their thoughts are to be able to discuss with the doctor, even if it's just one thing, because there is a lot of information in the, um, in the decision support tool. Next slide. So what did we do? The original um, decision aid was 11 pages. Because of their feedback, we shortened it to eight pages. We got rid of all of the um, pictographs. And um, initially we, have, we had another sort of revision. Initially we converted all of that into a table format and then we took it out, to, out of a table format and it's just a set of bullets. Um, we created way more white space, added more pictures, added more racially um, appropriate pictures and then gave a very clear explanation. So instead of the words that we used before were discontinuing and continuing mammograms. Now we say stopping very different word. Um, instead of talking about things like uh, risk, there are risks to doing this, there are downsides to doing this. Instead of saying going to get your mammogram, we say have a mammogram. Instead of using this word over diagnosis, and I can still re remember exactly where the, all of these are in the transcripts, over diagnosis, how could the doctor over diagnose me? That's, there's no such thing as that. And we changed that word to just laid there. And that made all the difference in the world. And so those are just some of the sort of word changes that we made, but of all the changes that we made so that we, when we tested it, um, you know, we got overwhelming support. I know what this means. I know what you need to do, what I need to do. I don't agree with sort of what the recommendations are. I'm still gonna get, I'm still gonna get screened, but now they can have a conversation with their doctor. Next slide. So, you know, 
what we hope we've done, what I hope that you will do as you're thinking about developing materials is having, making, making it and making it empowering, giving them the control of their health. We are in such a system where we control the health as their, their providers and that they rely on us. And there, there will be some adults, older adults are like, I'm not having a discussion with my provider. They'll just tell me what to do. I'm working on a similar colorectal cancer study. And I've had a number of people say, whatever the doc says, I will do. And so they're okay with that. And so we know that there's a diversity of where folks are, but for those folks who want control or, or even think a little bit that they want some control, let's help them do that when we're developing our materials. Let's frame our messages so they feel confident that they can ask and use it. Um, let's make it self-directed um, in lots of different ways, whether it's spoken or printed using illustrations, um, whether it's pamphlets or videos or audio tapes. However, it is that we think everybody likes to learn information. There's no, I can't, there's no one that doesn't want to learn about new health information. It's just really how they're going to learn about it and what they may or may not do about with it. So how do we make it self-directed that they can have a choice about what they want to do? And then let's make it solution oriented. So, we don't have to give them a ton of information, but enough, some specific strategic steps that they can say, you know what, I'm gonna talk to my doctor about this the next time I see it. And then it's like, well, ding, 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 that's it. That's what we want ultimately. Next slide. All right, fantastic. Well, we have a good amount of time for good. questions. So I'll, we'll give it some time for folks to either use the Q and A, um, feature or the chat box, but I know that we had a question earlier around applying some of these approaches to the fears that older adults have about the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, and I certainly, I have thoughts, I'm sure Dr. Cadet has thoughts. This might be a, a a slightly different situation where we're not talking about a skill we want someone to kind of teach back to us, but I would be curious where folks are getting their information, you know, if we're having an, an open conversation around, um, you know, where have you been he, he, listening to or reading information about the vaccine? What concerns do you have? You know, so a lot of it is just around, um, normalizing uh, having questions and, and making that a, a space where folks feel comfortable sharing their concerns. And also I'm sure being mindful of the terminology that's used in the materials that are readily available to patients mm -hmm. around um, COVID-19. And I'm not sure how, how much printed materials folks have already around the vaccination, but certainly I think there's an awareness from, um, from the healthcare perspective that there's going to be some concerns, some, some fears or some hesitations. So I'm hoping there will be, if there isn't already some materials that directly address that in a, in a um, health literacy kind of sensitive way. But Dr. Cadet, I'm curious your thoughts on this of applying this to something like uh, vaccine hesitation or wanting to boost vaccine confidence? So I think a couple of things. Um, it's, it's almost as if you read part of the, the, the work that I'm doing in the colon cancer, the colorectal cancer um, screening study. Um, so I was, a, what we were able to do, so we just finished um, interviewing about 30 older men and women um, with low health literacy around a colorectal cancer uh, decision aid that we're developing and to get their feedback. And what we added actually at the end were, and I'm just gonna sort of paraphrase, but we added at the end were, what do you know about the, what do you know about COVID? What do you, where do you get that information from? Who do you trust? What health needs matter to you most? Um, and how are you getting sort of your groceries and your, your, your medicine? And um, overwhelmingly folks were getting their information from the news. Um, and this was sort of certainly, I was doing this in the March to March to sort of June timeframe. We're getting their information from the news, not necessarily from their family. Um, many of them were having telehealth visits. So they were getting some of it from their doctor. Um, in Boston, my understanding from a couple of the participants is that the mayor had set up sort of some kind of regular line. So they would get automatic phone calls about different things. And so um, so I shifted a little bit around this sort of COVID, COVID vaccine and what would be helpful. And, you know, when I talk about, when I talk about it and I, cause I don't necessarily say one way or the other, 
what they should do because it is about their values and preferences, even though in my heart of hearts, I'm like, okay, they're over 75. I really want them to get it. They really need to get it. But that's, that's not what my role is. Um, you know, I do talk about, so what are, what are the, what, what are the, the benefits to getting one? And what we do know from these folks is they're scared. They're scared they're going to get it. They're scared they're going to die. There's no doubt about it. The fears are huge. Um, so there's and so the benefit of getting one is maybe this is where they get into you know maybe I won't die, but maybe I might die of something else. Um, and then the the harms maybe how do we know they have enough information? And so you know I've been talking to some folks around. You know, in fact, they've been doing work on this for a very long time. Um, it's sort of like the cake was cooked and we needed some good frosting. And because there was money, we got some good frosting. And so, you know, that might be a benefit of getting. Um, but I do think just sort of in general, when we think about sort of fears that they have for, for a host of reasons that are all valid, um, it really is about, so tell me what you know because you might need to sort of help because there, there are misconceptions out. There are just dead wrong misconceptions. And so you can correct those. You may not necessarily steer them in one direction, but teach back to me what you know. And then how do you, how do I, how do we explain this in a way that is a way that we would talk to our grandmothers um, in a, that says, so this is what is good about it. This is what might be not so good about it but this is what's good about it if you get it. And this is what, you know, what we don't know about and really be okay with the fact that it, there is some uncertainty. Um, but what we know, we know more of the fact that it's probably better that you do get it. So that's my initial, those are my initial thoughts. Yeah, I think that the prompt that you've mentioned a couple of times so far around asking folks to, to explain something to you in the way they would to a family member right. or a friend right. could kind of cut down hopefully on if you ask someone to teach it back to you right away, hopefully minimizes um, folks just kind of parroting the information that you've said, especially if it is a skill-based right. message or right. like a, here's multiple steps to this. Someone might be you know, so focused on like, oh, I need to remember the exact words and just repeat mm -hmm. them back when we're really wanting to see, well, if you ran into, you know, a friend or, or your, your sister, your mother later today, how would you explain what right. we, what we talked about today? So, yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense for kind of really understanding where some hesitation might be coming from. Right. So and not just saying, oh, do you are you hesitant to get the vaccine, but to explore right. kind of why. Exactly. I mean, I'll use my mother as a perfect example. Um, she is, she's exactly 75. And um, I said, I'm going to get my shot soon. And she said, why would you do that? And so she's like, I don't like needles, I'm not going. And I knew sort of deep like when I talk about sort of talking in a way to your to your family members, you know, you know, my instinct with my mother is like, mother, I'm coming to Connecticut and I'm going to go put the shot in if I have to. Like, we can't do that, of course. Um, but what I did do was I did sort of say, so what do you, so tell me what you know about this. And what she told me were all the things that she's like, oh, they just did it like that. I'm going to be a guinea pig. She sort of rattled off all of these things, which I know where they historically come from. Um, for an African American older woman and all of that. And, you know, I then sort of said, so you know, by the way, that there were African American scientists that were involved in this. So I got rid of that misconception a little bit, not a lot, but a little bit, so that she didn't think it was just a bunch of white men. Um, you know that this is what's been going on. And I'm not sure that it's changed her mind, but at least I'm giving her accurate information. And that sort of, and then I stopped, like after two points, I stopped and said, so tell me what I said, mom. And she could do that. She'll think about it and we'll figure out where she is. But those are like just a quick example of how, you know, I think about, and you know, and, and she's an accountant, she's a former accountant. So it's not like she, but there's something about this that is, feels very different when I talk about situational, where frankly, she's, uh, she's low health literate. Absolutely, absolutely. 
Well, we are just about at time. Oh. So I want to oh. thank Dr. Cadet and thank everyone for their time and participation. As I mentioned, when you close out of this webinar, uh, an evaluation survey, really quick one should pop up. We'll also follow up via email with all the materials related to this session. Um, uh, you should get that in your email shortly. We would love for you to stay in touch. We would love for you to pass along questions that might come to your mind after we close this session today. We're happy to continue this conversation going forward um, and be on the lookout certainly for future training and technical assistance activities. Um, and if there's anything else we can do to support you, uh, support you or your health center, let us know. Uh, and thank you again. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Have a great day.